In our topic of Chapter 12, solutions, those homogeneous mixtures, and in particular, if water is the solvent, we'll talk about aqueous solutions. So we have learned in um, Chapter 1 that most of the matter we encounter in the form of mixtures, they could be heterogeneous or homogeneous mixtures. Duke. I'm sorry. In this chapter, we'll focus specifically on homogeneous mixtures known as solutions. Solutions are mixtures, of course, in which atoms and molecules intermingle on the molecular and atomic scale, completely and uniformly blending evenly throughout. Some common examples of solutions might include ocean water that we swim in, uh, gasoline that we put in our cars is a, a mixture of components, and the air that we breathe is a gaseous mixture. It's hard to imagine that the air we breathe is called a solution. Why do solutions form? How are their properties different from the properties of the pure substance that compose them? And as we talk about further in this chapter, keep in mind the great number of solutions that surround us every day, and including at this moment, including those that exist right in your own body. So the blood, for instance, is a component made of um, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, the plasma is a liquid medium. A, a type of um, heterogeneous mixture since we have solids floating around in that uh, liquid plasma medium. So for instance ocean waters that we call that thirsty seawater. We know not to drink seawater because it causes you actually to dehydrate. Um, as much as the uh, ocean supplies the world's vast majority of water, uh, it is not drinkable water. And it does so because of the salt that's dissolved in there um, actually pulls water out of your cells instead of replenishing you'll dehydrate and the cell will actually shrink. Due to that high concentration of salts that are dissolved in seawater, the higher the salt content of your cells and therefore keep in mind the process of diffusion and in particular here osmosis is going to pass through your body pulling out water from your cells mainly due to nature's tendency for spontaneous mixing. So seawater, water is the solvent, sodium chloride would be called the solute, and together they create a homogeneous mixture. That even distribution of salt in the water is a natural tendency just to create an evenly dispersed um, process. So a homogeneous mixture is an even distribution. The water, of course, is the uh, polar solvent surrounding the positive and negative ions, pulling it into solution through a process we called solvation. So as that seawater enters into the intestinal tract, um, the concentration of the solution becomes more and more concentrated, pulling it out. Interior of the cell, of course, uh, uh, becoming more and more dilute. So a directional water flow would occur. So therefore, seawater, obviously, as it's pulling water from your cells, creates this spontaneous um, drawing out of fluid from your cells, actually causing those to shrink and a, a process known that could actually make you quite sick. Homogeneous mixtures called solutions, their composition may vary from one sample to another. In other words, I might have a dilute saltwater solution or a very concentrated saltwater solution, and yet they are a uniform mixture. So they appear to be one substance, though really they contain multiple materials physically blended. To separate out a solution, it only requires a physical process, a physical change, boiling the water out of a saltwater solution and we can get back the salt that we once dissolved in. Most materials we encounter are actually solutions. So air was listed as an example. Seawater was listed as an example. And we have this natural tendency towards spontaneous mixing. Knowing that it's really the energetics that are causing that to, um, to energetics favorably to create a uniform mixture. So when table salt is mixed with water, it seems to just disappear, but it really is inside being surrounded or the process of salvation through the little pockets that the water molecules do to their polarity. The salt's still there. You can tell from the taste. You can simply boil away the water and find it again. The salt is called the solute. The component that does the um, dissolving is known as the solvent.
the portion that we have the greater amount of is known as the solvent. So the solute goes into the solvent. The salt dissolves into the water. Nitrogen in the air is the most abundant of the gases. It's considered the solvent. The components such as oxygen or um, traces amounts of other gases, carbon dioxide, uh, helium, those would be known as the solute particles. So the vast majority of the component that we have the most of would be considered the solvent. The component that keeps its slate is called the uh, solvent and that, that changes its state is called the solute. If we look at examples of solutions, we can see that uh, solutions do not have to be wet. Alrighty, so in other words, thinking about um, solutions don't always necessarily have to involve water. So I just want to clarify that they can be in gaseous phase, they can be in the liquid phase, or there are solutions that are indeed in the solid phase. So a gas to gas might be an example such as air. Nitrogen is the most abundant, therefore we know it would be the solvent. Oxygen would be considered the solute. Gas in a liquid, such as a soda pop, club soda, and open up a can of Pepsi and carbon dioxide bubbles out. As long as it's under pressure, we can keep the gas in, but opening the lid releases pressure and the gas comes bubbling out. A gas might be dissolved in a solid, such as a uh, catalytic converter is absorbing carbon monoxide, and, and this is a process to keep pollution uh, best we can um, from contributing to greenhouse, greenhouse gas effect. And that uh, platinum, PT, um, is, is a metal that is inside of that catalytic converter that is used to adhere the carbon monoxide gas into it as it goes through this converter. Liquid in a gas might be an example such as water vapor in air, especially on a humid day. We can definitely see signs of that. Liquid in a liquid might be uh, any drinking alcohol. Liquid in a solid. Um, amalgams are fillings in your teeth. Um, mercury is a liquid metal dissolved into silver or other metals, although they're getting away of putting mercury into, um, into our dental fillings. Solid in a gas, naphthalene, which are mothballs dissolved into air. We could also have solid in a liquid, such as seawater, salt dissolved in water. And solid in a solid could be any type of alloy, brass or bronze, pewter, or all examples of solids dissolved in solids to where they melt the solids together and allow them to harden. This is an example of a gas being dissolved in a uh, water medium, a can of pop. Again, as long as it's under pressure, we see that the um, gas stays dissolved, but this person is actually releasing the pressure. The carbon dioxide bubbles, and you can see those are pointed as CO2, are being um, dissolved in the water. So we're looking at CO2 bubbles out of a, a little soda pop coming Brass is considered to be a homogeneous mixture or any alloy and it's just showing you that because we can mix per different percentages of copper with zinc and come up with different hardness to the brass, we can mix them in different ratios and therefore we consider brass to be a homogeneous mixture. The um, brass that we used to make pennies pre-1983 um, and now, of course, they've taken out the more expensive copper and have um, put in more and more zinc. 95% of copper, that became too expensive to plate those. Other types of um, uses of brass would incur jewelry, um, cartridges, um, Munz metal that we see for nuts and bolts. So again, just depending upon how much copper compared to zinc, we get out different strengths and therefore we have a different component and just showing us that zinc and copper mixing by different ratios produce a homogeneous mixture. Now the term solubility, if something dissolves in another component, it is said to be soluble. If it does not dissolve into another component, it is said to be insoluble. Soluble substances would include examples such as salt going into water. Um, ionic compounds dissolving into water would be something called an ion dipole, intermolecular attraction. Bromine dissolving into methylene chloride, both of those are considered to be nonpolar substance. 
London dispersion forces would be the driving force or the intermolecular attraction. But if I have a polar to a nonpolar, there are no intermolecular attractions and therefore they are said to be insoluble. So the solubility of one substance into another really depends on two factors, that nature's tendency towards mixing and the type of intermolecular attractions such as dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, the uh, hydrogen bonding, and of course ion dipole. There has to be some sort of intermolecular attraction to convince the two to actually uh, create a solution, a uniform blend. So if two um, ingredients are indeed um, either polar to polar or nonpolar to nonpolar and have a natural tendency towards mixing, we can see that with time a uniform concentration is indeed achieved. So looking at this slide, I have a um, barrier, perhaps a um, oh like a plasma membrane for instance. And on the left side A you can see water and on the right side you see sodium chloride. If the barrier is removed there is a natural tendency for molecules to mix spontaneously. So given enough time even without stirring, I don't even have to stir it and provide an outside force, there is a natural tendency for um, spontaneous mixing and that would produce a uniform concentration. So mixing in this whole solution process, what is this natural tendency? Well it's a thermodynamic property just as enthalpy, delta H is a thermodynamic property. Entropy, which is S for whatever reason, entropy, the natural tendency towards chaos. Things want to be chaotic, that's a natural tendency. I think of my son's room, it's a natural tendency. As time goes by it becomes more and more messy, Things, unless it inputs energy to create order. So a natural process towards the system of lowering its energy through the release of entropy. Chaos, random mixing creates a more uh, uh, chaotic environment. So with the natural tendency to create a disorder or a chaos, disorganization is entropy. We can see that given time, gases separated by a barrier such as neon and argon, when the barrier is removed and time goes by, we can see there's a natural tendency for the two gases to mix uniformly. So I don't have to uh, stir, I just have to provide enough time and gases of course wouldn't take much time because they have complete freedom to move around and each gas is just expanding to fill the container. It spreads its energy out and lowers its entropy. So by creating this disorganization, lowering the entropy is the natural tendency. Entropy is the measure of energy dispersal throughout the system. There's this natural drive to spread out over as large of a surface area as possible. So each gas is simply expanding to fill the container. It spreads its energy out and lowers the entropy. The intermolecular forces or intermolecular attractions in the solution process, we look at solute-solute attractive forces. We look at solvent-solvent attractive forces and both considered to be endothermic. These intermolecular attractions that we're considering, we've studied in, chap in a previous chapter, chapter 11 I believe. The dispersion forces were nonpolar to nonpolar increase with the ever increasing length of the hydrocarbon chain. We have dipole-dipole interactions that occur between two polar molecules. We have hydrogen bonding as an intermolecular attraction such as an ethanol containing an OH bond and a water containing an OH bond that meets the criteria for a hydrogen bond. Recall that dispersion, dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonding are collectively called van der Waals forces. The fourth would be an ion dipole interaction where a sodium ion or a chloride ion through the process of solvation gets pulled into water. So the attraction of the polar end of a water molecule literally separates the electrostatic attraction between a sodium ion and a chloride ion. So these are the forces called intermolecular attractions that drive a solution. If it occurs there has to be some sort of an attraction between the molecules. So as we mentioned the sol uh, solution interactions include solvent to solvent, 
solute to solute, and then driving force overall that has to be the greatest for a solution to occur, the solvent-solute interactions. The driving force to create a homogeneous solution. What would be the overall drive for a solute and solute to interact and create a homogeneous mixture? The relative interactions in solution formation would include solute to solvent must be greater for a solution to form. So solute to solute, they have to be overcome. Solvent to solvent must be overcome. There must be an overall driving force to convince the solute and the solvent to interact to create the homogeneous mixture. If the solute to solvent is indeed equal to the interactions between the particles of solute and the interactions between the particles of solvent, a still a homogeneous solution would form. This might be an example of a dispersion force where nonpolar and nonpolar would mix simply because there's an even distribution. There's nothing repelling or um, attracting. It's uh, simply slide past each other. However, if the solute to solvent force is not strong enough to overcome the attractions that solute have for one another or the solvent particle have for one another, there will be no solution forming. If the solute to solvent have no attraction, such as oil and water, nonpolar and polar, there will be no interaction and therefore no solution would form. So when solute to solvent attractions are weaker than the sum of the solute to solvent, we see that the only form in energy is not strong enough to overcome that um, interaction between those like particles and the no solution on our particle. If we remember a simple rule of likes dissolve likes, we're able to uh, predict quite readily if a solution forms. So the solubility, there, there, there's a limit, a top factor of how much, if something is indeed soluble, how much something goes into solution is indeed um, reaching a max. And it's temperature dependent. It might be pressure dependent if it's a gas. So there are certain things that affect solubility. The amount of solvent, I mean, Water can only hold so much salt and, and before it becomes saturated. So there's usually a limit to the solubility of one substance into another. Gases are always soluble in one another. And again, that's just an even distribution. Two liquids that are mutually soluble are said to be miscible. A liquid dissolving in a liquid is miscible. Alcohol and water are miscible. Oil and water are not, so they are said to be immiscible. And the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in any given amount of solvent is referred to as its solubility. And we'll take a look at some graphs of solubility. Temperature dependent, pressure dependent. If I warm up water and the kinetic energy is, is increasing and the water molecules then separate out, I can actually increase the amount of salt. So hot water can hold more salt than cold water and vice versa. So will it dissolve? The chemist's rule of thumb, likes dissolve likes. A chemical with uh, will dissolve in a solvent if it has a similar structure to the solvent. When the solvent and solute structures are similar, such as polar to polar, a solution would form. Nonpolar to nonpolar, a solution would form, but not one of each. So the general rule of thumb, likes dissolve likes. Water is a polar solvent. It has a structural feature of an OH bond. Methyl alcohol has a structural feature of an OH bond. Ethyl alcohol is polar. Acetone, which is nail polish remover, is again polar. We're looking at all kinds of structures at the top here. Water, the alcohols, and acetone is polar. And I could predict any of those four in placed into the other would indeed form a homogeneous mixture, a solution. Notice the bottom part where we have hydrocarbon chains such as toluene, hexane, diethyl ether. If they are nonpolar, nonpolar to nonpolar would indeed form a solution. But if I place something from the top into something from the bottom, water into carbon tetrachloride, no solution. Toluene into alcohol, no solution. So likes dissolve likes. Based on their structural formula, we begin to predict if a solution will form. And that's really the, the first part of our assignment will be predicting if a solution forms. We have to think about polar to polar, nonpolar to nonpolar, and never the two shall meet in the middle.
So if we were asked to predict if a vitamin is soluble in fat or soluble in water, we know that there's two categories of vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins, which our body retains, water-soluble vit uh, vitamins, which our uh, body flushes out on a daily basis through the urine. We know water is a polar solvent. Fat is a mostly nonpolar molecule, long fatty hydrocarbon chains. So look at vitamin C. I noticed that there are some OH groups hanging off of the vitamin C structure. Those four functional groups of an alcohol um, make it a very polar substance. Vitamin C, I would predict to be a water-soluble vitamin. Knowing that water is polar, it would dissolve a polar substance such as the vitamin C structure. So based on the vitamin C polarity, it would be a water-soluble vitamin. But you compare that to a different vitamin, such as vitamin K. When I look at a structure for vitamin K, I'm noticing that the... Um, Two carboxyl groups, two C double bond O groups, are polar, but their overall geometric symmetry suggests that the overall structure is perfectly symmetrical. So it is a nonpolar, I don't see any dipole moment, that the top and the bottom cancel each other, creating a, an equal but opposite pole. There is no region of interest, a nonpolar structure here. So nonpolar overall, because of the cancellation of, uh, you know, the symmetry of the molecule, this would dissolve into a fat, fat-soluble vitamin. So as we begin to examine the structures, we have to decide, is it polar? It goes into water. If it's nonpolar, it dissolves into fat. And you just look at the overall symmetry of the molecule. Friends, you wouldn't be expected to be able to draw a vitamin C or a vitamin K, but looking at the structure, you should be able to talk about its polarity. Again, we're going to decide if something would dissolve into hexane, a long hydrocarbon chain, C6H14, just a straight six carbon chain, so completely nonpolar, or water. Water, of course, we know to be very polar, possessing hydrogen bonds. Look at the first structure here for naphthalene. Naphthalene is the formula for mothballs. They have that very pungent odor. These are two benzene rings attached to one another. I notice a series of resonance. Nonpolar, there's nothing of interest in that molecule. So nonpolar molecules such as naphthalene would dissolve into the hexane. Nonpolar to nonpolar, where the intermolecular attraction would be dispersion forces. Second example is formaldehyde. <clears throat> Excuse me, formaldehyde is a polar molecule. The C going up to the oxygen there with the exposed electrons. A polar molecule such as formaldehyde, that might sound familiar from biology days. We used to use formaldehyde to preserve um, specimens such as our pigs or cats in anatomy class or worms from biology. They still do worms. So polar formaldehyde into polar water. Stearic acid, notice at the very end, this is an, a, a long hydrocarbon chain with a, a polar uh, COOH group at the end. Notice the incredible length of that hydrocarbon chain with a little tiny part that's polar at the end. I'm going to predict that it's going to dominate in the nonpolar solvent C6H14. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16 carbons in a row, an incredibly long hydrocarbon chain, and then finally a COOH, that organic acid at the end. That long hydrocarbon chain says that nonpolar part is going to be dominant, and therefore it would, it would uh, dissolve in the nonpolar hexane. So stearic acid into nonpolar hexane. Now we're going to notice a trend. The short carbon chains with a, a, a carboxyl group at the end would dissolve in water. But as I increase, in, you know, ever lengthening that chain, then the nonpolar chain begins to dominate. So this is a slide that, that uh, notices this very trend. Methanol, CH3OH, one carbon, completely miscible in water, hardly dissolves in hexane at all. Let's tack on another carbon, increasing the length a little bit. Look at, I start to see that they're miscible in both. See, I have a nonpolar region of this molecule, the hydrocarbon chain part, 
that's the part that's being pulled into hexane. And I have a polar part of this molecule, the OH group. That OH is being pulled into the water region, so that's miscible in both. Take a look at the third, propanol. Three hydrocarbons and then a, a, a polar area there for OH, miscible in both. The longer the hydrocarbon chain becomes in butanol and again in pentanol, notice how it becomes less and less soluble in water and more and more soluble in the nonpolar hexane. So when the hydrocarbon chain is short, the polar area pulls it into water, but as it's increasing its nonpolar carbon chain, adding a carbon ethanol to propanol to butanol to pentanol, increasing that uh, hydrocarbon chain makes it become more and more miscible in the nonpolar solvent and less and less miscible in the water. So these alcohols have a polar region, that's the hydroxide, the OH part of it, and the nonpolar region, the CHN part. And as we go down the table, we made that observation that the nonpolar part gets larger, gets longer and longer in that chain. But the OH stays the same. And what we'd expect then is the solubility of water is decreasing and the solubility of hexane is actually increasing. And this stat shows us it indeed does. This would be the conclusion of the first part of our lesson, knowing that we do not have to cover the energetics. There are no calculations of lattice energy required for our course. So when we start up again, we will be um, skipping over section three, calculations of lattice energy and calculation of heats of solution, and we'll uh, pick up again. So pause the video here and fast, uh, kind of go forward into your um, PowerPoint notes, getting ready to start up again in section four. We've jumped ahead now to section four, our solution equilibrium, and those factors that can affect solubility. So solution equilibrium, that overall dynamic equilibrium process between the solution forming and unforming, the solute being drawn into solution at the same but opposite rate as it's falling back out. So that dissolution of a solute and a solvent is indeed in an equilibrium, dissolving in, falling back out. So initially when there's no dissolved solute, like a pure cup of water, and the only process possible is dissolution, when it's the overwhelming process is coming in. But shortly after some of the solute has been dissolved, some of the solute particles start to recombine to reform the solute molecules. Now here's what it's saying. I start to sprinkle salt into water. Now initially the water starts to separate this Na ion from the Cl ion, drawing it into solution. That's the initial dissolving process. But as I continue uh, to keep adding salt, some of it will start to recombine. Na is attracted to Cl, positive to negative, and that recombination to reform solute particles begins to occur. However, again, it's just an initial time that the rate of dissolution is much greater than the rate of deposition and the solute continues to dissolve. The term deposition to fall back out and land on the bottom of the beaker. However, eventually, the salt as it's dissolving, we end up with an overall dynamic process where the rate of dissolving is equal to the rate of deposition. The rate of being pulled into the water is occurring at the same but opposite, you know, in terms of falling back out. So the solution is saturated with solute when no more solute will dissolve. There is a capacity is what I think about that term. Um, saturation the maximum amount of solute that can dissolve at a certain amount of at a, at a certain amount of kinetic energy at a temperature so this process of solution equilibrium when na solid is dissolved into water it's first added to water the sodium and the chloride ions begin to dissolve in the water they're being separated out when we see I'll try to get this slide to change as time goes by, Na solid 
NaCl solid being pulled into Na plus aqueous, Cl negative aqueous, that process we called uh, solvation or hydration. And the solution becomes more concentrated. Some of the sodium and ions, the chloride ions begin to recrystallize, recombine, until we see now at the far right of this slide a dynamic equilibrium has occurred. And that's shown by our um, directional arrow opposite but equal when the rate of dissolving dissolution equals the rate of recrystallization called deposition the dynamic equilibrium has indeed been reached so the process of dissolving is not static but dynamic solubility has a unit as well the solubility unit is typically in grams per 100 mils but it depends on what it is you're dissolving if it's a gas that unit wouldn't make sense we don't weigh gases so the solubility limit a solution that has a solute and solvent in dynamic equilibrium is said to be saturated if you add just one more crystal it will not dissolve so there is a certain capacity the saturation concentration depends upon the temperature and more so for um, gases it would be pressure related. Under high pressure I can get more gas to dissolve than I would for low pressure. That's why we um, pressurize our soda pop to keep the gas dissolved in. A solution that has not yet reached its capacity is said to be unsaturated. It has room for more. So at that specific temperature, if I add more and it dissolves, it is said to be unsaturated. And a solution that has more solute than it's supposed to have, that saturation point, is said to be super saturated. And that super saturation uh, is, is a very unstable arrangement and it has to be made. These super saturated solutions are not stable, but they're manipulated. Um, when we make hard candy at Christmas, no, I don't do that, but some people who make hard candy um, create a super saturated solution of sugar water and let it crystallize out. Solutions can be made saturated at non-room temperature conditions, like let's uh, warm up water to really, really warm and try to uh, get as much solute to dissolve as possible. Then if they're allowed to come down to room temperature slowly, without being disturbed, without being agitated, just ignoring it, don't even let a dust particle fall in, the extra solute that was dissolved at the hot temperature may stay in as that solute and solvent to, as a solution uh, uh, cools down. And for some solutes, instead of coming out of solution, when the conditions change, they remain in this kind of stuck in between phase. And that's said to be a super saturated solution. Super saturated solutions are unstable. Even if you just bump it or add a seed crystal, you will see all kinds of excess solute come pouring out of solution. And when we did this in our lab for week one's lab, we used sodium sulfate as our uh, crystal. Here's a slide showing sodium acetate to be made into a super saturated solution. So as we uh, look from left to right on the slide, of course it's sitting on a hot plate to begin with. They warm up a solution of sodium acetate. And then it's on uh, second slide, you see that it is not on the hot plate, so they're allowing it to cool. And then of course, as time goes by, they've agitated. So if slide uh, to the left is super saturated, and here they are taking a stirring rod or dropping a, a seed crystal, one crystal in, and all kinds of excess solvent or solute comes pouring out of solution. So solubility is temperature dependent. If it's warmed up we can get more in and as it cools down the excess typically falls out unless we have a you know a few examples that can be made into super saturated. Solubility is generally given in grams of solute that will dissolve in a hundred grams of water. Grams per hundred mils is another typical uh, designation. For most solids, the solubility of these actually increases. I warm up the solution. And these solubility curves can be used to predict solubility of um, grams per hundred mils versus um, temperature. So we look at solubility curves and decide if a solution is saturated, unsaturated, or supersaturated. If we look at a particular um, curve, if we follow, um, oh, let's pick um, 
Oh, well, let's try potassium chlorate. The bottom line, KClO3, just simply it might be the easiest to look at. If I look at an intersection on potassium chlorate, let's slide over to the X, find 30 degrees, come up to the Y and find the 10. Now I'm picking that because it's an easy axis there. I can see that's intersecting at 1030. So at 30 degrees Celsius, 10 grams of potassium chlorate will dissolve into 100 grams of water. That is its saturation point. If the maximum it can hold is 10 grams at 30 degrees, that's the definition of saturated. If I have less than 10 grams dissolved in, it is unsaturated. And if I have more than 10 grams completely dissolved in, it would said to be super saturated. So these solubility curves you can see are quite unique to every salt. Every salt, uh, you know, we see potassium chloride. Sodium chloride is a pretty flat line, isn't it? That's kind of the purple one going across. Warming up a salt sodium chloride water solution really doesn't affect its solubility as much as uh, some others that we see. What's unique about sodium sulfate, Na2SO4, is that I see it actually decreases in um, solubility as we warm it. Potassium dichromate is listed, lead to nitrate, calcium chloride, sodium nitrate, different salts. And again, with this particular slide, you could be asked to find saturation points at a particular temperature. So this slide will come in handy as you're asked some of your homework problems. You'll be asked to look at the solubility curve and decide if something is saturated, unsaturated, or supersaturated. And just to repeat, an important note there of how we would determine that. Solubility curves can be used to predict whether a solution with a particular amount of solute dissolved in water is saturated, falls right on the line, unsaturated, falls below the line, or supersaturated, it's above the line, all dissolved in, holding more than it should. The temperature dependence of a solid. We can see solubility is reported in grams of the solute per 100 grams of water. And as you're looking down some of these examples, we have potassium chloride, sodium chloride, ammonium chloride, lithium sulfate, calcium hydroxide, cesium sulfate, and potassium nitrate. Those are the names of the salts. And we see that we have, um, you know, just different varying uh, temperature effects on the amount that the salt can hold into that specific amount of water. So this is just the um, very numbers that the previous graph uh, placed onto an xy axis for us. So these two or three terms, saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated, allow us to predict if, if uh, indeed when we're looking at a graph, if a solution uh, falls below, right on, or above the line. One of the most common um, applications or operations performed by a chemist is trying to remove uh, impurities from a solid compound. And one method of purification involves dissolving a solid into a hot solvent until the solution becomes saturated. And as that solution slowly cools, the solid will crystallize out at a specific temperature, leaving all the impurities behind. A common application of this, this, uh, these definitions, purification by recrystallization. Recrystallization of potassium nitrate. We can purify this salt by dissolving a little less than 106 grams and 100 grams of water at 60 degrees. Look carefully at this curve, 60 degrees where the top point is. And the solubility lies at about 105, 106. As you allow it to cool, this has a very steep slope, doesn't it? As it cools to zero degrees, we have about 13.9 grams will remain in solution. The rest just simply precipitates out. And that precipitation that forms, this, the dropping out of the potassium nitrate is known as recrystallization. All the impurities stayed in the water. Purified potassium nitrate has crystallized and has fall to the bottom. Practice this. Decide each if each of the following solutions is saturated, 
unsaturated or supersaturated. And this is really just practice reading a graph. The color codes on the graph, potassium nitrate, KNO3, is the bottom uh, sign there. KNO3 is the very bottom in the list to the far right of this graph. So we're following a, a um, a line, kind of a pink-purple line, if you will, um, and I notice that it's decreasing as temperature is rising. That solubility is actually decreasing. Skim over to um, 34 degrees Celsius, best you can, and skim up to find um, the 50 grams, 50 grams of potassium nitrate, KNO3. Oh, that's the dark purple. It's a very steep line. I was following the wrong. I think I was following lithium sulfate when I said it was decreasing. But this particular color code is the steepest line of all. And I think right at 30 degrees, 50 grams, that's got to reach 34 degrees, 50 grams. That's right on the line. That's saturated. 50 grams of potassium nitrate into 100 grams of water at 50 degrees. It has room for more. It's falling underneath the line, so it's unsaturated. So pause the video here, study this graph very carefully, and make sure that you can look at a graph and decide by skimming over to a certain temperature, finding the correct salt. That's half the battle, as I messed up the first time. Find the correct salt and decide if it falls below the line, it's unsaturated. If it falls right on the line, it's saturated. And if it is falling above the line, holding more than it should, it's considered to be supersaturated. Now those were salt dissolved in water. Gases are water soluble. Polar gases are water soluble and their temperature dependence of solubility has the exact opposite effect. When I warm up water, the gas actually bubbles out, becoming less soluble. So I'm going to say that again. Solid ionic compounds, such we call those salts, when they dissolve, the general trend, generally, is increasing temperature, increases solubility. Gases have the exact opposite effect. Gases, when we warm up water, generally bubble out. They leave solution. Therefore, they have a lower solubility. Gases with high solubility usually are, are reacting with the water, like carbon dioxide and water going to form carbonic acid. So for all gases, the solubility of the gas decreases as the temperature increases. Um, this called thermal pollution. Um, I know near the power plant downtown, the um, power plant releases water into Muskegon Lake, and that water has to be pretty darn close to what the water is outside in the lake, or if it's warmer, it actually removes the oxygen and it, it provides a fish kill. So if there's a lot of fish, dead fish floating around in that area, that's telling you that they're releasing too warm of water from their industrial processes. So um, fish kills are a common thermal pollution problem. The temperature dependence of gas solubility in water is this particular chart. We're looking at um, you know, that list of data points now being plotted, and it's showing us uh, carbon dioxide, CO2, and another gas called acetylene. And clearly a negative slope as we're warming up um, the temperature, the um, solubility of the gas decreases. So with these um, data points, we can see the natural trend. Carbon dioxide, um, acetylene, here's the nitrogen and oxygen at various temperatures, again just providing the evidence of a decreasing solubility of gases as the temperature increases of water. The pressure dependence on solubility of gases in water is known as Henry's Law. The larger the pressure of a gas in contact with the liquid, the more soluble the gas is in the liquid. So if I'm thinking of a capped syringe, if you will, like a piston, 
If I'm pressing down from uh, a state that was in equilibrium and I increase the pressure, more carbon dioxide is going to dissolve. I'm giving the gas above the liquid less room to move around, forcing it to go into a uh, solution, and an equilibrium is indeed restored. So the water level, I notice that there's a certain amount of gases that have dissolved, and then above the water are gaseous forms, so dissolved below the water line and undissolved above the water line, but pressed down and we forced the um, carbon dioxide to dissolve. I mentioned this was called Henry's Law. The solubility of a gas, S stands for solubility in the little gas there, is directly proportional to the partial pressure above the surface level. Partial pressure of the gas is P sub gas. Solubility is calculated by using a proportionality constant. And they've been determined already for us. We don't have to experimentally determine them, but they're a published list. Henry's law constant is nothing more than a proportionality constant to kind of straighten out that graph. Oxygen's um, proportionality constant called Henry's law constant, 1.3 times 10 to the negative third. And the unit there is molarity over atmospheres of pressure. Molarity is simply saying how much dissolves over pressure units of atmosphere. So when we use partial pressure in Henry's law, be sure that it's in an atmosphere of pressure, not a kilopascal not a millimeter mercury called tor, so that these proportionality constants uh, carry the correct unit. So solubility can be calculated for a gas knowing its proportionality constant and the partial pressure. The higher the pressure, the more soluble the gas. And this particular let, uh, list of data points shows partial pressure increasing above the solution. You notice for oxygen, it is also increasing in solubility as well as the solubility of carbon dioxide is increasing as the pressure is increasing. And that proportionality constant called Henry's constant is simply there to create a straight line as we graph. When we look at that graph, we see that partial pressure affects the um, carbon dioxide much greater than the oxygen. It's much more of a flat line. So not saying that it has the same effect on all gases. That's what the proportionality constant, Henry's constant, does for us is to give us that visual. So the blue line representing carbon dioxide. If I increase pressure, I can get a whole bunch more of carbon dioxide to dissolve, but I'm not really affecting the amount of oxygen that would dissolve. So cans of pop that are pressurized will dissolve carbon dioxide. Not so much the oxygen, but carbon dioxide will dissolve quite readily under pressure. And when I release the can of pop, open it up, the carbon dioxide is going to bubble out. So releasing the pressure, and we hear that sound when we release the pressure on a can of pop. Henry's law can be used um, to find pressure, or it can be used to find solubility. So the next series of slides are going to require a calculator. Let's pause here and get yourself a calculator. We're going to be working some problems.